the how's everything in arizona uh it's a hundred and something degrees <laughs> wow yeah we're probably gonna have a pool party this afternoon wish wow. we were there yeah well, um, uh, so folks, last week we had an amazing discussion, um, walkthrough of the Air Force Museum and uh, looking at a lot of the Cold War planes and, uh, you know, my family, a um, lot of history in naval aviation. And so it's great to be able to talk about that and uh, take you through Naval Aviation Museum and some of the exhibits uh, and made a list of the planes at the museum so these are these are the planes at the museum that my father has flown wow that's wow. quite a list that, that is quite the list <laughs> yes so just to go ahead and get you started <clears throat> you can hear me right I hear you we perfect, hear you sir. great dad yes Okay, let me say one thing. You mentioned Cold War and something came to mind. I was at the University of Michigan at the time mm -hmm. and my dad called me and he said, we've got a really bad situation going down here in Cuba, here in Cuba, and they're calling me down there. And he was in the McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And he took a C-130 down to uh, Key West, and they were there expecting things to blow up down there when they were moving over to Cuba. So anytime I hear war, you know, my dad said, get out of Ann Arbor. And uh, of course, I couldn't go out of Ann Arbor because I didn't have a car. I was a, uh, I was a freshman in school. <laughs> but it was worrisome enough that they sent all the uh, transports and fighters and whatever down to uh, to Key West and my dad was worried enough that he thought things were gonna blow up. Wow. Why did he want you out of Ann Arbor? He thought if they're going to hit some places in the country mm -hmm. with these missiles Ann Arbor being one of the at the time one of the premier uh, research colleges in the country right and they're, specifically they're, in the nuclear power and nuclear medicine yeah. we had a nuke uh, reactor on uh, north campus mm -hmm. yeah so he figures get out of Ann Arbor and it was in the winter time I remember that it was snowing and I went out on the diag and there were people out there protesting something i'm not sure what and they were barefooted and it was in the snow and i said what's up with this you know so uh i of course got all my friends together and said get ready to hunker down here guys it's probably going to go up which at a later time made me look kind of foolish because it didn't but uh, uh but they were at least forewarned but this was yeah. leading into what year was this would have been 60, what, five? Yeah, uh, so you're, you were just ahead of the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like, correct. there was a reason for that tension. Oh, yeah. But the ship was en route to, uh, to Cuba. Right. And we hadn't turned it back yet. And uh, the president had already said, you're not going to put missiles in Cuba, period. And uh, therein was the, um, the crunch. There's a pretty we were strong going. argument that that is the closest to a nuclear war that that, that civilization ever got to. I can, tell you, I can tell you from talking to a lot of the people who were involved in one way or the other, it was very, very close, and the U.S. was ready to do it. Well, yeah, yeah and, in, and in the end, um, Khrushchev blinked, right? They That's right. The around, but it That's took a right. while. Yeah. Luckily, luckily so. But let's let's go look some airplanes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> we started just started out with a C one thirty. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, Dad, I've you got... want to say something about the museum? Yeah. Th this goes back a really long ways, and when Joe mentioned something about the museum, I all of a sudden 
all these pictures came to mind and none of them look like the museum that we see today. When I first saw it, it was a Quonset hut down on the ramp at the end of the runway and a little building in town, which was later to become a bowling alley. And we're playing cards. And the Navy should have one too. So it was his idea to begin with. And the next thing I knew, I was playing cards, waiting for the weather to break. I was an instructor uh, at VT4 in Pensacola. And I taught air-to-air -air gunnery and carrier qualifications. And the commanding officer came in. He said, okay, people, gather around. Everybody in the na every naval aviator is going to contribute $25 and we're gonna build a museum. And that's the way it all started for me. And that would have been in 1960, uh, 1971. Mm -hmm. And up to that point, I guess there had been an effort for a museum, but it was just that little Quonset hut, and they were, went out for volunteers to renovate the aircraft that they were bringing in from around the country. You know, they decided we're going to have one of everything. And so they brought them down, and they had them all sitting on a ramp. But here we have these really old airplanes just sitting there, uh, really looking ugly. And people would take them, the volunteers would take them, and over a very long period of time would make them look pristine, just like new. They were beautiful. And uh, his idea was to have one of everything the Navy had ever flown. So at $25 a head, that's where it all began. It went from, I guess, that first building was 9,000 square feet to what it is today, which is 350,000 square feet. And it's got some airplanes in there that I have uh, some knowledge of, some connection with. And uh, I'll talk to those as Joe takes you through the, uh, through the museum. I really haven't seen all of this, this tour. There's an F-11 right there, the 217. I was going to flight training. Uh, I finished up my prom primary flight training here in Pensacola. And the next step, well, what happens at the end of primary is they decide what you're going to fly. And back then, it was either props, helos, or jets. And I'd made up my mind that I was going to fly jets or was going to do something else. So <clears throat> uh, I finished up in Pensacola and got my jets, and the next stop was Meridian, Mississippi, which is uh, between primary and advanced training. So went on up to, uh, to Meridian. When I, uh, and when you finish Meridian, you go off to Texas. Anyway, they said, okay, we're sending you to Beeville. And and you're going to be there about four months more because you're going to be flying the F-11, which is a supersonic aircraft. And I said, wow, the war is going to be over. And there were a lot of people who thought this is the very end of it because we had put a hold on bombing in, north, in the north and whatever. And I just said, there's no possible way I'm going to miss this war. So uh, send me to Kingsville, where we don't have the supersonic, but I'll get out of there and get to Vietnam four months earlier. So that's what happened. Wow. Well, um, Joe? Yeah. In the, in the virtual tour, there's a button on the right hand, uh, bottom right hand, <coughs> that, that makes this auto rotation thing things stop because oh I thank you it was driving me crazy 
We tried last night to make that thing stop. Yeah, so there, you see that no, no, the pause button, there's a pause button in the middle. It, not that, but the, right next to it. Where it has a pause button? Yeah. Stop auto rotation. That makes it stop. <laughs> oh my God. That was just driving me crazy. That, that, annoyed, that annoyed me to no end. And so I found, tried to find a way to stop yeah. it. So, sorry, sorry for the interjection. Yeah. My the, flight instructor in advanced training uh was one of the first people he was the commanding officer of the first f-14 squadron cool his name was yeah his name was moon moon vance think his people his uh relatives were hippies yeah i'd suspect moon vance and then the f-14 you see out there in front of the museum uh, Carolyn, my wife, is a real estate agent here in Pensacola, and she sold some property to uh, uh, one of the F-14 drivers, and he talked to me about it and what a fantastic weapon it was, but too hard to maintain. And I think he told me they had 40 hours of maintenance time for every flight hour on it. By, yeah, by the end. Because it got to, it, it had such complex hydraulics. Right. That, well, that, complex everything. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the, that literally just the operating costs get out of control once the airframes start getting old. And they were talking at the time about putting only one pilot in the, uh, in the airplane, like that F-8 you're looking at right now, 201. Mm -hmm. Then you would only have to pay retirement pay for one person instead of two. <laughs> uh, seriously, that was That's the conversation. <laughs> You know, now that seems goofy because it was a pittance. Uh, but uh, back then, th there was a lot of uh, discussion about that. I have of the of the F eight, um, the the Museum of Flight in Seattle. They have um, they bought the original uh, XF XF eight U one. So uh -huh. that's the original prototype. And uh, they bought that. And uh, there's a guy who used to do. Um, affect structures uh, in the Air Force and that got hurt in the Iraq war. And uh -huh. he's, he's now um, like just restoring airplanes for the Museum of Flight is his thing now. And he's like, he's young, he's like, he's not even 50. So he got that airplane and he, so, he single-handedly effectively restored that airplane into glorious, in the glorious state of the exactly when they had it, its first flight. Wow. So that's, that sits in the that sits in the Museum of Flight, and I had, I just strolled into the Restoration Center one day, which is up on in, in Everett, um, and uh, then he said, "Hey, I'm gonna," and 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 I found him kind of out on the on the in the parking lot, and he said, um, "If you're interested, I'm gonna show you something." So uh, he showed me kind of that that plane in the middle of being restored before it was painted. It's uh, it's glorious. If you can, I I'm going to steal. I'm going to steal. Can I steal the the screen share? Sure. For a second? Uh, do I have to, to do anything, or you can just grab you it? Need to, you need to stop, and I, and I, I think. Okay, good. Um, I will go and share that screen briefly. And I have some footage of um, them landing. My dad can tell you about why the wing moves. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the that's the. So this is how I found it. Oh wow. <laughs> um, huh. I'll be darned. That looks like just exactly like the F-8. Yep. And so this was while it was being restored. And so this is, this is, the, this is the original. This is the first that they built. Uh, and and so then this is after they, they painted it. Well, yeah. yeah. I saw a guy sucked in that intake one time. Oh. oh. Was on, well, he's okay. Uh, it was a yellow shirt on the flight deck. And uh, the ship rolled, and the pilot went to 100% to keep it from rolling back and off the ship, which, of course, sucked the, whatever was in front of it down the intake. And the guy hit the, uh, the blade. Before he hit the blades, there's a vein, and he was wrapped around the vein. 
he got off the flight deck from that time on. He said he wanted to do something else. Yeah, I know. I, think <laughs> I wonder he, why. Uh, reconsider your life choices at that point. Uh, Joe, take it. So, so because because I didn't know how to stop the auto rotation, I got annoyed at the tour. So I just made a bunch of the the airplanes here. So, okay. um, so I don't I, know if you I was, let me get Jim. Jim, can you jump back to your story? Like, so you tried to get to Vietnam as quickly as possible. What did, what aircraft did you end up in? The A four. Oh, because it was subsonic. It was subsonic, yeah. Uh, the truth is, why do you want to go sonic? I mean, there are only a few times when it comes in handy at all. Sure. Um, I was in advanced flight training down in Texas, and the air aircraft we were flying was the F-9 Cougar. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's Korean vintage, right? Yes. Well, I'm not sure that uh, it was post-Korea. They actually didn't fly it in Korea. I don't think. I'm just, you know, uh, I don't remember it being a Korean airplane, but it was from that time period. And uh, I remember flying the two-seaters with my instructor and then flying without my instructor. And it didn't seem any different even when I was, you know, soloing and he wasn't in the back seat. It was still a two-seat airplane. And I remember flying the first AEF-9. It only has one seat. It was the combat version of the aircraft. And I remember the feeling. I thought, my God, there is no back seat. This mm -hmm. is, it is only me, you know. Anything that happens, it's my responsibility. If things are good, I'm the only one that made them good. And I had such a great feeling that I went back to the, my detailer in Washington and I said, when I finish up here, I want to go FH, single pilot, one like person the in the seat. airplane. Yeah. And when uh, the selection time came, they had no F8s available. All they had were in single seat were the A4s. Right. So I said, that's great. Anything single seat. Well, we, they were shooting down lots of A4s. Uh, no F8s. So they were looking for pilots to go out there and hurl themselves at the ground and, uh, and evade some SAMs. So I gladly went. You know, it was a single seat aircraft. I was in combat and uh, I was happy as could be. Uh, really, really glad to do it. And what work were you doing? Were you uh, air, close air support, ground pounding? Well, both. You know, our mission was close air support when necessary. Normally, that would be down in the south. And as you get further north, up around the pass area, at this time, the president had already said no more bombing of Hanoi. We were trying to, uh, to give him a breather, I guess. So we were bombing up in Mugi and Bang Karai Pass area, which is in North Vietnam, but just not, not uh, the capital. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, made sure that nothing on the ground moved. This would be the interdiction rule, rule, uh, rule, that if a truck moved, we blew it up. And if they can't get food, if they can't get munitions and whatever out to their troops in the field, they can't live. They were actually taking people and putting them in trucks and putting a handcuff on them and handcuffing them to the steering wheel. Mm. to make sure they didn't run away from the truck when the uh, the airplane showed up. Ooh. Yeah, that, uh, that later on when our people were in there taking pictures, uh, whenever, you know, our the friendlies uh, got to take pictures of them, they found these people uh, handcuffed to some part of the truck so they couldn't get away. But we effectively stopped everything that moved on the road. So that's the, uh, that's the Ho Chi Minh Trail um, interdiction. 
Yes. Well, it was anywhere. Anything, anything moved, we blew it up. And uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was, of course, the primary. At one time, it was the primary uh, method of transporting both food and uh, munitions. Mm. Yeah, parts of that trail were are red clay. And believe it or not, their trucks in many cases were blue. It was like painting a target on somebody's back saying, here, blow me up. Wow. You know, it was, it was crazy. I said, why don't you camouflage those trucks or paint them gray or something? I almost felt like sending them a note or maybe a, a text or something and say, paint your trucks a different color, guys. This is, this is too easy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, most of the uh, close air support was done by Marines. That's their job. On a couple of occasions, I, uh, I actually was shot down on uh, a close air support mission. I was out with a flight of four and wow. got a call over guard, guard frequency, broadcast to everybody, um, saying I need uh, a certain kind of munition at a certain place. Mm -hmm. And actually, we had, uh, it was two, two planes at the time. I was going to blow up some, uh, a bridge that the VC were, were building underwater. Uh, this was a tidal thing in a lake. The lake actually moved up and down with uh, out to the ocean or something. But they would build it like crazy when the water was down so that later it was covered up. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, I, my flight was out to, to blow up that bridge. They were building it. and We just watched them for like, you know, a week or so. And they were finally getting it to a point where it was going to be usable. So it was time to blow it up. Uh, so that I was en route to do that. And... The commanding officer of my squadron <clears throat> was on another uh, two plane off to get some trucks up in Bon Carai Pass. Well, we both got the call on guard saying we need these munitions. And I had Mark IV gun pods and a thousand pound bomb. And my wingman had some 500 pound bombs. And then my CO, his flight, had uh, 500 pounders, Mark 82s. So we joined up, you know, we just hit a rendezvous point. And when we got there, the reason they needed somebody is because a bunch of Marines were being overrun. In fact, some of them had already been overrun and their machine guns, their 50 cals had been taken by the Vietnamese. So when we showed up, uh, our job was to both get the guys who already had the guns and make sure nobody else could could get close to the Marines. And the fact the forward air controller in the area said, look out, it's really, really hot in there. But you got Marines dying and it's our job to go in and make sure that uh, they're okay. And yep. uh, so we went in, all four of us, and uh, I was was number three being the lead of the second section and uh, as I pulled off my I was jinking when you pull off a target well first of all let me just address the supersonic thing you don't go into a target supersonic and you don't really leave it supersonic you may go into afterburner to get out of there quickly before they can get you but mm -hmm. airplanes Jet airplanes uh, fly pretty much the same speed when they're in on a target. And uh, in this case, I was Jane coming off the target. You go left, you go right, whatever. So they haven't got a, a good firing solution on you. By the time they decide where they're going to shoot, you're already going the other way. Anyway, uh, I looked down and my hydraulic pressure <clears throat> was uh, was going down quickly and soon thereafter as I 
you get your nose up and you're coming off target about 500. And uh, just with that speed, you know, I'm going to climb to probably six, 7,000 feet, uh, w even if the engine quits, which it did. And my CO came up and he said, oh, Jim, you're on fire. I said, oh, boy, that's beautiful. <laughs> and yeah. hey, did you not hear you, your plane being hit? I well, when you're down that low, I was at a couple hundred feet, right? And when you're that low, uh, especially that time of day, your airplane bumps around like crazy and it makes noises, right? Uh, so yeah, I heard the noise, and in retrospect, you know, in thinking back on it, I said, Yeah, well, sure, that was me being hit. But at the time, it was just, uh, I don't know what those noises are. Just another regular flight noise of being bu in bu <laughs> <and> air. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you're, first of all, you're pretty, uh, you're a little on edge because you can see all the bullets coming at you. Yeah. And any minute, any, any second could be your last, you know, and you have to just kind of put that away and say, I'm here to do a job, you're, and forget about uh, them firing at you. But so you're desensitizing yourself to some, uh, to some extent. Does the A4 have armored cockpit like the, uh, the A10 has? It, it had Kevlar in, uh, the, under the belly. But no, was the answer. Now, its, uh, its protection was because it's small and because it's fast and it's got, it had the best roll rate, the best maneuver rate of any airplane ever. Mm -hmm. It was so maneuverable that if you uh, start spinning, you know, uh, doing aileron rolls, you can actually get to a point where the aircraft, they call it spiral divergence. The aircraft wants to swap nose with tail and flip end over end. Oh. And of course, if you do that, then you've got the air coming down the intake, uh, down the tailpipe and going out the intake, which burns up your engine real quick. So you don't want that to happen. Yeah. <clears throat> I've had it right to that point where the spiral divergence, uh, I could feel it. The you airplane feel the plane was starting, starting to, to want to swap. Yeah. That's really spooky. So you're anyway, at the, you're at the point of the story where your CO is telling you you're on fire because you don't know you're on fire. No, I didn't at the time. Uh uh. No, it was all behind me. Right. And uh, uh, he started yelling, eject. Well, by this time, I was a little bit higher than. Uh, then optimum ejection. The optimum ejection envelope for the A4 was 5,000 feet, 210 knots. Right. And I thought, you know, I'm first of all, I'm going to try a relight, see if I can douse the fire, and uh, and then get a relight on it. And, oh, and. Every time you have a, anything go wrong with an airplane and the, air, and the aircraft is lost, later they put you in front of a board and you have to justify absolutely everything you did. Right. So I just came up on guard. And, uh, of course, this is going out to everybody. And I said, here are my instruments. And I read them off to my commanding officer I, because your guard is taped. Mm -hmm. And I thought at no time in the future when they put me before a, a board, are we going to have any question about what was going on? And uh, I let them hear, you know, eject, eject from the, uh, from the CO. And uh, I read out my instruments and uh, then I hit my 210 knots. And by this time I was at 4,000 feet. And uh, so I, I went. Well, a, a little bit of uh, additional information. The reason we were, f we were actually on the beach down south of Chulai is where it happened. <clears throat> kind of an unusual place. But the Vietnamese had dug a whole city under the, 
the sand and dirt. Wow. They had a little all tunnels and whatever and living quarters down there. And uh, anyway, I uh, let's see. When I got hit, I was on the way down, and the waves were about thirty feet that day because we were running south from a typhoon. That's why we were down south. So the waves are 30 feet. And all I could think of coming down was, well, first of all, I tried my PRC, my radio, to, uh, to talk to people, and the radio didn't work. I couldn't. It's almost like when I tried to get on this morning here with, uh, with Zoom, I couldn't make anything work. But uh, it's probably me and not the radio. But... Uh, Anyway, I dropped it and it went in the water because it didn't work. But anyway, <clears throat> um, I had been, anytime the weather was bad, I went either facking in, in country, go fly with the facts, or go fly with the Hilo guys. So I had been up with the Hilo a couple days earlier, and I looked down, and I said, boy, I'd like to go scuba diving down there. Look at all that kelp. And they said, kelp? That's snakes. <laughs> what? <laughs> and it was sea snakes. They have huge herds of them, and they just, I mean, it's from the air, they're just black masses. Wow. And, yeah, so I when I got back, uh, I, I mentioned something about it, and... The flight surgeon, who's also named Speed, actually, um, said, yeah, you know, we have ejections, and the pilots are coming down in the chute. Everything is hunky-dory. They should be okay, and we never find them. And it's, uh, we believe it's because of the snakes and the sharks. Wow. Oh, yeah, sharks everywhere down there. You, you don't even want to go in the water if you can, you know, when we're down uh, – off the Nang and whatever, they had a pretty nice beach, but uh, they would tell you, do not go in the water, you're going to get eaten. So anyway, I'm on the way down, and I'm thinking, I'm smarter than those snakes and, and sharks. Uh, yeah, the water is pretty rough, it's 30 feet, but I'll be okay. And so, oh, I had... I, I, I'm not coming down yet. Let's back up just a second. Uh, I ejected from the aircraft, and the hydraulics had been ruptured or whatever, so things weren't working properly. And they tell you if you eject and you know what's going on in the ejection sequence, you've got a problem because it all happens so quickly you're not even going to know it. Well, here I am. I've got a face curtain pulled down. And I'm seeing sky, water, sky, water. Oh, my God, I'm tumbling. I'm end over end. And so I release the curtain. And at that point, you don't get automatic seat man separation. I have to reach down and pull what they call a guillotine that cuts you loose of all the, the cables and, and uh, everything connecting you to the seat. See, normally you get a big balloon behind you that inflates almost instantly and boots you out of the seat. In this case, I had to kick myself out of the seat, and then I'm going to have to pull my own ripcord. But I kicked out of the seat, ready to pull the ripcord, and all of a sudden the seat, when I got out of it, was between me and the relative wind. Uh, and I looked up, and here it came back at me. And I threw my leg up in the air, my leg and my arms, when it hit me. And it, it hit me in the kneecap and popped my flight suit and the, uh, the skin on my knee. And I looked down, and my kneecap was hanging out of my flight suit. Yeah. A, a, bright, a bright white kneecap. <sighs> And I thought, this is not good because I'm going into the water into, uh, Salt with, water. with sharks and yeah. sea snakes. And they just love that blood smell. Mm. And I thought, I'm, I'm a goner. They're going to get me. So I still had a little time. And I uh, pulled 
the seat pan handle and my seat, my shoe, uh, my uh, little one man raft fell down below me and it was on a cord and I thought a lanyard and I thought, aha, I am smarter than the snakes and the, um, and the sharks. So I pulled it up and I tied myself in it. I thought I'm going to hit the water. I may not even get wet. <laughs> <clears throat> Re so remember on, night. You're, you're, in your, not, you're on not your parachute. Thinking, you're not thinking all that clearly sometimes. <laughs> you know? So when I hit the water, I hit the top of a wave and flipped upside down. Ugh. Now I'm tied in my life wrap. Uh, Upside down. Wrap, upside, upside down. Upside down in thirty foot waves. Were you well, proud of yourself in that moment? Uh, <laughs> I made some resolutions if I ever got out of it, but it became apparent very quickly that I wasn't going to get out of it. I was gonna die right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I had no breath left. Uh, I was upside down in high waves. I said, uh, now without even thinking, I've got a shroud cutter on my left shoulder, uh, uh, the top of my shoulder. And it is to cut shrouds in case you come down and you're in trees and whatever in the jungle, you can cut yourself out. And it's very, very sharp. Anyway, I grabbed the shroud cutter and pulled it across my stomach and it cut the cable, it cut the, uh, the cord. And I was able to get out of it and I can tell you, it was my last, I, was, I had already grayed out. I was dead. I mean, and there was no, no getting around it. And I've still got that, uh, that shroud cutter. I, I, one of these days, I'm going to put it in a frame and hang it on the wall. It's, it's my friend for life. <laughs> it did a great so, service that day. Well, now I'm in 30-foot waves. And... Uh, the helicopter, after about, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, showed up, and we're just sitting there. Well, the procedure is, when the helo shows up and you're in the water, you get out of the, uh, the raft, and you swim away from it. Otherwise, when you get out, uh, the rotor wash from the helicopter can bring it up into the rotors and you lose the helicopter and then everybody's in the water. Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I, uh, I swam away from the raft as per uh, instructions and whatever. The helicopter turned and left. Here I am in 30 foot seas without my raft and any survival equipment, and the helo is gone. And let me tell you, it's kind of an alone feeling when you're all you've got is your May West gun, and you know there are sharks and sea snakes all around you, and hope is running out real, I'm real sure fast. You had some choice words for the helicopter, too. <clears throat> Well, later, after being rescued uh, and uh, our uh, discussion about what happened was, they didn't see me. They saw where my aircraft went in, and they were looking at the hydraulic fluid on the water. I, was, I just happened to be there looking at the helicopter, thinking they've got me in sight, and right. they're going to pick me up. Ah, yeah. So the procedures actually changed at that point. As a matter of fact, a couple of procedures changed as a result of that uh, that uh, recovery. I also had, you know, the round metal ring that mountain climbers use. It's a spring-loaded, a carabiner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, that's what it is. Yeah. Well, we were the first squadron in Vietnam to use those. One of our guys went out and said, why don't we use these instead of getting into a horse collar and being pulled up in a, in a helicopter? Mm -hmm. All we do is we've got these on our, uh, on our vest and we just take the cable that comes down 
and click it. Whip it into one of these and they can pull me up. It saves time and it's a lot safer. Yep. So I, uh, I got the cable and put it in, uh, in place and gave them the up sign. And they said, no, put on your collar. They didn't know what it was. They hadn't been briefed. So here I am and I can't get the cable undone and they're not going to do anything with me positive until I, I get the horse collar on and I can't grab the horse collar because I'm bouncing around 30 foot waves and I'm thinking still the snakes are going to get me. And it, it's a long story, but just days before, we take target practice on the number two elevator and we were shooting snakes. You shoot one of them and they go crazy and become cannibalistic and eat each other. Uh, and that's, you know, we, we use them as targets, shooting snakes. And all I could think of was they're going to get back. I mean, th they're going to get back at me for shooting a couple of their buddies. <laughs> and I, you know, this, this actually was my thought pattern. And I'm, you know, looking back on it, I can honestly see that people under a great deal of stress have uh, some thoughts which are different. <laughs> but I can say this, that all of my training pulled me through even when the thought process was flawed. Mm -hmm. I did things automatically because of the flight training. And I had also skydived in, uh, in college. And I really believed that if I hadn't, you know, kicking away from the seat and saying, and finally realizing this seat is not going to get me out and doing it and pulling my own ripcord and all of those kinds of things, I probably wouldn't have done, uh, at least not as efficiently as I did had I not been uh, a skydiver before. What is the what is the level of the amount of training you get in the um, as a pilot for the ejection procedure? Just theoretical. You think about it all the time. Now that we have a uh, a trainer, everybody goes through the trainer. You go down, you uh, you strap in, you talk to a technician who looks at your position in the seat, corrects it. Obviously, you want your spine straight up and down. Any, uh, any curvature in it, you lean over, it's going to break it on the ejection. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so everybody goes through the ejection seat trainer. Then we also have uh, the, what they call the Dilbert Dunker, which is if your airplane goes in the water, first of all, you're probably dead if it's a jet, but... Uh, you're trained to get out of it underwater, out of your ejection seat. So you've had uh, several ejections in the seat. Uh, it, just, it only pushes you up the rail, of course, probably 20 feet or so. Okay. <clears throat> and then, and, then but, and you talk about it all the time. I mean, it, it when do you eject? Uh, if you've got your nose pointed at uh, a new development with all kinds of young people in there, or new married people, just their own house and whatever, do you eject or don't mm -hmm. you eject? And uh, do you have your nose pointed towards San Francisco and eject or do you ride it in? If you ride it in, you're dead. Uh, and it's a choice that every pilot has to make. If, you're, if your airplane is disabled, I don't think uh, anybody is going to fault you for ejecting, getting out. You're saving your life because if you don't get out, you're going to die. Yeah. So At the same time, I know uh, people who have died, and there's no doubt in my mind. Nope. That they couldn't get out. Mm. They uh, they chose not to. Oh, okay. The yeah, I think one of the what I found just remarkable in your story was um, just as you were ta talking about the you know thinking about bailing out um, about reading out the instruments. Yeah, that just struck me Ed, as incredibly 
cool headed in the face of you knowing that your aircraft is gonna is is about to fail it's about to like, explode yeah yeah but then it's about to that, that you then that you then <clears throat> have kind of the presence of mind to say they're going to drag me in front of some some uh, some board and so therefore i want to go and capture all the data and then you capture all the data and then you go and bail out that seems um that is remarkable that like thinking of the thinking through the consequences down down to that point is uh, I find that remarkable, or, or or is that something that is so clearly top of mind when you think about it? When you think about abandoning the aircraft, I think we had. When you sit around after a flight and you got shot at a lot, <clears throat> you think you think about what could have been. I mean, any one of those uh, one hundred five millimeter rounds could take you out in a heartbeat. Uh, the, and you see them exploding around you, and you can actually feel them. You know, you look at the blast and you feel the the concussion, and you say, the next one could be my last. If you let that sort of thing bother you, uh, then you need to go do something else. You're there to do a job, yeah. and the job is to get the bridge or to get the people or whatever it is. And you have to put everything else behind you. And you've got to be able to think under those conditions. And believe me, people that can't don't make it. Now, we've got a flight surgeon with the squadron. He goes out on liberty with us. He drinks with us. We have a good time. He's one of the guys. But he's not out there just to have a good time. He's out there to observe everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's his job as a flight surgeon. It's not to tell you to, to how to clear your ears or what not don't fly when you've got a cold or whatever. He does all of those things for sure. But his primary job is to gauge the psychological readiness and worthiness of a person to be flying an attack aircraft that carries bombs on it. Mm -hmm. And... So the people that are flying those are, we like to think, a breed different. And it wouldn't uh, surprise me at all if I was in a plane listening to somebody call off those numbers. I, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the least that, you know, they've, they've been there at this point in their minds so many times. What else do you do? You're sitting around when you're not, not flying. You got to think of something on the carrier. And it always comes back to the combat environment. What do I do? When do I eject? Mm -hmm. uh, do I carry a gun? You know, when, if mm -hmm. by the, uh, if you are carrying weapons on you, and I always carried a 38 in a, uh, in a nine millimeter. I look like the Frito Bandito. I had bandoliers across me with all kinds of bullets and whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, if you punch out or hit and punch out and you're on the ground, you're required to use that weapon to the extent you can to get away. If you don't have a weapon, uh, it becomes easier for you to give up. And every pilot has to make that choice. And mine was, I carry two guns and enough, uh, and nobody was going to take me alive. It was, uh, I made up that, yeah. made that decision long before it ever had to be enacted. Um, and that, that's just one of the things you think about. And when do I eject? Everybody in their own mind has some idea so when the time comes it's not a thought process that you have to spend a lot of time on you've already thought through it a hundred times and what happens on takeoff if uh, my engine fails right at liftoff what do i do i'm sitting there on a bomb laden fuel tank with uh, thousands of pounds of fuel and bombs and whatever rockets missiles yeah and uh, i just I, I rotate and i'm a single engine airplane and my engine qu quits 
am I going to be able to realize that quickly enough and eject to get away from it? All of those things are thought, that's what pilots think about all the time. So, so, so for that situation where you are effectively, the catapult is pulling, is, is pulling you uh, uh, forward and uh, the, the engine quits. I mean, the, the, how much time do we actually have to decide to pull the, the, um, the seat? <clears throat> That's a second or two. Actually, I was thinking about take off on a runway in this case. <clears throat> oh, you have no time. In, uh, no, you are going from zero to 150 in two seconds. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of time to think about anything. If you lose, it, it's after you've left the deck that you probably have... four seconds, five seconds wow. to, uh, to make the decision and to eject. I mean, that's, now, a, that's a grave, that's a, that's a super <laughs> grave decision to make just in, in that, in that super short time period and you need to be ready for it. Absolutely. And it's because you've thought through it so many times that again, it's, it's instinctive. I've watched people eject off the cat. Uh, I've seen two F-8s that blew out their burner and settled into the water. Now, they still had the uh, basic engine going, so they had a little bit more time. But uh, one of them actually landed in the water, and I thought, that guy's a goner because they're going to suck that cold water into that hot intake, and it's going to blow, uh, which is what we had already had always been told about the F-8. And it didn't. And the guy popped the canopy, you know, blew the canopy off, climbed out of the cockpit, and it's still fly, uh, floating. And I was on the bridge at the time. And here he is, and stepped up on the, uh, the dorsal part of the aircraft, waved at us, and, and, and did a swan dive <laughs> into the water. I said, man... What class? That was beautiful. I said, that was great. Yeah. The other guy died. He hit the water and uh, it, it, uh, it blew. So he didn't make it. But um, so, Jim, after the accident with the A4 <clears throat> and you obviously got re recovered, you must have had some time. Did you go back stateside then to rebuild your leg? No. I, I went to uh, the. I w right down to sick bay and they stitched me up wow the kneecap and believe it or not they gave me some booze you know they uh, you're not allowed to drink on board a ship but the flight surgeon broke out these little bitty bottles like he used to get on the airlines mm -hmm. and uh, i said give me three or four of those you know <laughs> I, and i downed them and the admiral was standing there of course the admiral came down from the bridge to to get a brief on what had happened because Marines were dying. We, we went in and saved a whole bunch of Marines. So the so mission he, was a know, success, he, even if you did lose the aircraft and they got their Oh, absolutely. Back. Oh, absolutely. It was, you know, I mean, the, to lose an A4 or even to lose me, the pilot in the A4 was a small price to pay for saving those Marines. Sure. Why yeah. Th that's your job. If you can't do your job. Crap. That was really something. Oh God. Okay. Uh, where were we? We were at the flight deck punching out. Uh, yeah, you, you were talking you about were, uh, about getting back. <clears throat> yep, that's what you were talking about. You getting put about. put back together. Oh yeah. Uh, so anyway, did you continue they, flying A4s after that, Jim? Like you, you kept working? Absolutely. Uh, they put me back together, uh, sewed up my leg, and I went up to the ready room. And I was sitting in the ready room, and the flight surgeon called me from medical and said, don't move. You've got a broken kneecap. The x-rays came back. You've got a broken kneecap, so don't move. I'm sending up some people for you. <laughs> so... Some people showed up and they've got a a, uh, a stretcher, 
And they put me on the stretcher. And here, I mean, it's hard to get through a carrier over the knee knockers and whatever with a stretcher. Anyway, they got me uh, down to a room on a flight deck, on the uh, hangar deck, which belonged to my CO. He said, okay, we're, I'm going to give you my room because it's much more convenient than yours. And so we were out there for another week uh, bombing. And we went into uh, port, and they sent me over to see a uh, orthopedic surgeon. And they did x-rays and whatever. And this whole time, I couldn't move. And I, I, they put a cast around me all the way up and around my waist. And it's over 100 degrees was the average temperature on the ship every day in my room. So you sweat, and you sweat into this big, huge cast. Anyway, uh, I went to the doctor, and he came out, and he's laughing. And he said, those damn flight surgeons, you've got a bipartite patella. I said, what's that? He said, when you're born, your kneecap is in three different pieces, and as you age, they grow together. What your flight surgeon was looking at was the joining line of those different parts. Oh, interesting. So I really hadn't broken my kneecap, and I had been in that cast for an entire week, took the CO's room, lost flight time, and had to be embarrassed with this orthopedic surgeon. So, yeah, the short of it is. had a unique is, kneecap. Yeah. Well, no, it's not even unique. It was just a couple of lines. He said, uh, you know, anybody should be, any doctor should be able to see that. He misinterpreted. Well, I, you don't have a radiologist on the ship in many cases. So it's the flight surgeon who's looking at the x-ray, who's evaluating it. And in this case, he was just wrong. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so... I was mad because I lost a week of flight time. The ship pulled out the next day. I was on it, and I was back in a cockpit. I was, you know, back at it. Wow. So those were, well, are we time-wise? Um, we still have a little bit of time. We're an hour in. Great. So there's, I think there are more planes here on the on the list. Like the, I, I want to hear the A8, the <clears throat> F8 story. So when did you transition to the F8? No, I didn't transition to the F8. I was in the in the bar point, the big O club, uh, the focal point of everything going on in QB Point. You see the F, the F8 with the sidewinders on the side of it there. This is right. the last of the gunfighters. What it had was sidewinders and machine guns, 20 cal machine guns. Mm -hmm. uh, the aircraft that came after that did not have machine guns. So that's why they call it, you'll see the two guns on the side, on the right side there. Mm -hmm. And of course they've got two on the other side of the nose too. But anyway, the, um, the uh, other aircraft that came after that, the F-14 uh, and the F-4 did not have guns. Okay. That's why they could call it the last of the gunfighters. <clears throat> anyway, we were in the bar, and uh, I was with uh, a couple F-8 drivers, and one of them uh, said, yeah, I, I remember flying the, uh, the A-4, and I, I love that airplane. I'd just like to go back and fly it again. I said, well, I'd like to fly the F-8, see how that goes. And he said, great, why don't we go down and you fly the F-8, I'll fly the A-4. I said, okay, let's do it. Uh, after you've been in the O Club for a couple of hours, that sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, I had to get a brief on the wing. Uh, you'll notice that the aircraft doesn't have any flaps on it. it. What it has is a wing that goes up and down. And for the aircraft is super, it's fast for the size of its engine and it's super slick 
And when you know, that means it goes fast, but it doesn't land all that well. Yeah, there is, there's the It doesn't wing. fly slowly yeah. particularly well. That's right. That's exactly right. I should have said that. That said it better. So it, it doesn't so fly low to the ground. I don't know how you land that on a carrier with so little stroke in the landing gear. Well, that's why it has that wing. It, uh, it lowers the nose. Without that, the pilot is aiming at the sky. Uh, when he's landing because in order to get an angle of attack high enough to be slow enough to land on the boat, he's got to be nose up. Well, uh, when you put the wing up, that means the nose can come down so he can actually see the ship that he's going to land on. That's a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd look for that in an airplane. That's a good yeah, idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, when I was in aeronautical engineering, we talked about that, actually. How do, we got to see the ship in order yeah. to land it. So uh, it is so low. It's, it's really kind of an, it's difficult to land on board the ship and it's dangerous. Of all the ramp strikes we had, most of them were F-8s. And most of your ramp strikes are, are at, at night. And I've been on the ramp when the F-8 hit the ramp and the first thing is you probably get an explosion from the fuel that uh, that's ignited. Then you've got the sidewinders on either side of the aircraft. They cook off. And about this time, the pilot said, God, I got to get out of here. He ejects and you've got a big rocket in the seat that goes off. All of this is really spectacular at night. <laughs> I've, <clears throat> I've seen two of them, and uh, one of them, uh, the pilot was able to eject and made it, miraculously wow. enough, and the second one, the, uh, the cockpit actually, it hit the round down so hard that it slowed the aircraft to a point where the aircraft almost stopped on the flight deck. It, 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 of course, sheared all the gear off, so it's sliding on its belly. And it got to the edge of the angle and seemed to hang there for the longest time, you know, in retrospect. I went back and looked at the movies. It was like a second and a half or something. But it, it seemed forever, and then it fell into the water with the pilot. Uh, he was one of my, my – we play cards sometimes in the evening, and – he was one of them that not only played cards with me, but owed me money. So, <laughs> yeah, he, it's pretty. I mean, it, it the, was, the the lifting shoulder <clears throat> wing thing. I mean, no other aircraft ever did that. It be wouldn't flaps have been simpler, honestly. I, yeah, I don't know the answer uh, why they designed it like that. I can tell you that the tail end of the F eight is so close to the ground that you can, you can easily raise your nose and run the tail into the, uh, the round down or in, yeah, into the, uh, the flight deck. You could see it as, uh, as they touch down. Well, no, and those ventral fins, too, like so close. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I yeah. There are plenty of dinged-up ventral fins. Yep. Yep. It's a, a beautiful airplane, yeah. but uh, it just – it didn't land well, and but, at night, night landing on a carrier is uh, is hairy. You know, I, at go ahead. My understanding: the ventral fins they seem to have a couple functions. One is um, that to well, it held the uh, an air intake for um, uh, oil heat exchanger, but another is that. Um, they talk about them being ablative that if you if you were to hit the engine you know it would take the fins first <clears throat> well they are they require them for stability of the aircraft it's a round aircraft essentially mm -hmm. and it's very easy to uh, to get a rocking motion and uh, those fins help it maintain stability you know, and looping back to the beginning of this story with the Cuban Missile Crisis, it was recon F-8s that took the really good photos. That's right. Of the, uh, of the, the missile sites <clears throat> they were trying to, they were building. 
Yeah, we still had while uh, being of, shot at. Well, see, uh, they used to sing a song. Uh, it's no fun flying, landing aboard a carrier at night. Mm. I think I liked it more than almost any other pilot. <laughs> uh, uh, for some reason, I don't know. They didn't like it very much at all. But the photo beanies used to come in, and they didn't have their own ready room, so they would pick the one with the best movie. And they would come in and sit down and frequently would get chided because they don't fly at night. They fly only in the daytime. Well, it's when hard they to take pictures take at pictures. night. <laughs> so, no. No, so and they would come in and sing. Uh, what was it? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but you can't bust your ass in the movie. <laughs> right. Um, so, so I just looked. I just looked because uh, um, of this the wing design. So this was the only one that went to production. The only aircraft that had that. Um, but apparently, during World War II, Bloom and Foss. Um, had a prototype transport of which two were built, which had so-called vari variable incidents. <coughs> and uh, there was another, um, this supermarine type 322, so that's a British airplane, that also had a, a variable incident um, wing, but none of them having a construction like that, like what we see here. Yeah. Huh. Well, so I mean, shoulder wing on a fighter plane is weird anyway, right? Like generally, they're they're waist wings. You don't put them up that high. Yeah. But I, but I think, I think on my screen more. right on my screen right now, I have four quadrants, and. I'm in two of them, and Richard and Gert are in the other two. Mm -hmm. It's not a picture of a person. It's a... They're just names. Just a name and a round circle and a shoulders. Yeah, yeah. White. So I can't see anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't see the share that's going on right now. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, try resharing. <laughs> re try resharing that, Joe, and it'll try and it'll sure. pop back. It just happened. Yeah, it happens sometimes. Oh, there we go. Let's see what it says. Pitch. Okay, I'm looking at the F8 again. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, and that, <coughs> mounting the uh, the sidewinder on the fuselage like that is pretty odd too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and normally you carry them under the wings. Although sure. I, uh, with the uh, F18, I believe they have them. Someplace on a fuselage, I can't remember now. The Blue Angels have them on their airplanes. Of course, they're not weapons, but uh, I don't know. I I've been with their face when they fired them on occasion. I also used to. Uh, our photo bird was the F eight. If mm -hmm. the other ships that that sailed with us at the time. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, were the A what is it? A six. Right. The vigilante for uh, photos. A seven. No, the A seven was the Crusader. Oh, okay. I thought the A6 Crusader was the, two uh, or I thought the A six was the intruder. Oh, did I say A six? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm wrong. It uh what is it? The A three, four. Five, the six, A5 is the vigilante. Okay, it's the A5. Yeah, really long uh, airplane. <clears throat> yeah, they they were re they had a big reconversion too. I think I saw one on the Intrepid in New York. Well, yeah. it was designed to carry a, an internal atomic weapon to be supersonic, to carry a, a nuke, to get where it was going and get back, and uh, to evade radar because of its shape and whatever. The only problem was when they tried to drop bombs, they'd open the bomb bay, and the aerodynamics would keep the bomb in the aircraft, kind of bouncing around after. That's it had been a bad released. day. Bad day. <laughs> so, so that eventually, is the A5 was all you know. That's the only thing it did was uh, re recon. 
right? A you photo. Don't to, you don't bird. have to drop anything. You just take pictures. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, certain people in the squadron were designated as specialists in certain areas. It's like a, a, an orthopedic surgeon. All he knows is orthopedics, really. A little bit of the rest of the stuff, but he specializes in orthopedics. And we had the same kind of thing in the attack community. And one of the things I specialized in was the Shrike. And the Shrike missile was one that followed a radar beam. Yeah, it was the original anti-radiation missile, right? That's, right, that's exactly right. Did you so, go Sam hunting? Are you crazy, Jim? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> The, the Air Force guys were called wild weasels. What did they call yeah, you? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Just Jim. They, Just, uh, what I, I uh, no matter what airplane was going over the beach, in fact, even airplanes from the other ship would call over and say, please send Jim. Right. A and Jim I, and his strikes. Yeah. So uh, I would follow in. And since they would go supersonic, in taking their pictures, or at least very fast. Uh, so, I, I, I would be in the middle of a big circle. They would get in a circle and go near supersonic to take their pictures, and I would stay in the center and to, uh, move the nose of my aircraft, therefore the nose of the strike, around the circle. And it was a big game. The Vietnamese... <clears throat> knew the tactics. They knew I had 250 pound bombs on the aircraft and I would drop them so they'd think that I dropped the bomb. Of course, they had their, their people with telescopes and microscopes or telescopes and whatever looking at me. And they would see something come off the aircraft and they would say, aha, he just fired a shrike. And they would turn the radar off. Right. Until the shrike went stupid if it was a shrike, then they would turn it back on, reacquire the target in time to, uh, for, the, uh, for the SAM to take it out. So it was a big game. I would raise my nose and in some cases drop a 250 pound weapon so they'd think it was a shrike coming off the airplane. Uh, I also had little squibs, like little fireworks that I could fire so they would think, you know, they would see the the fire coming from the airplane and they'd think it was a shrike being fired. Right. And all of this to keep them from illuminating the A5 or the, uh, the F8 photo bird. Right. And it, I could normally shut them down. You know, I never had anybody hit. So <clears throat> I guess in that way I was successful and it was a lot of fun because by this time, we were not bombing Hanoi. Right. But the photos were being taken of Hanoi to see what they were doing. So at least I was over Hanoi with ordnance and uh, playing games with the Vietnamese against their, their best guess of what I was doing. You know, it's kind of like playing poker. And... You know, I practiced in my mind and in reality with the airplane tactics for evading a SAM. SAMs are going to be supersonic. Right. And uh, if I know the SAM is coming, if I see it take off, and I mean, it's, it's really big. When that, when that thing takes off, you can Telephone see it. Telephone poles, no, right? It is. It's huge. So when I see it come off, I start uh, the evasion and I get in the point where in order for it to follow me, it's perpendicular to my flight path and I pull into it in order to, uh, to follow me, it has to go to more G's than it can tolerate and it pulls the fins off and breaks right. apart. So you'd actually tear the missile apart by forcing it to turn too hard. Correct. That, could you see that, or are you too busy grunting in a hard turn at that? No, point? at that point, you're all you're going to do is uh, pull the G's as many as you can. You pull to the gray point and pull more. Right. And uh, hope it's enough. I mean, yeah, I hope you picked your path right. That's exactly right. Everything you can do to evade it has already happened by that time. All yeah. you can do is pull. 
Yeah, you're committed at that point. Right. It's, you, you're, in a, you're in a Skyhawk. You're like in the most nimble airplane you can imagine. That's right. Uh, you could turn. And it That's can. exactly right. And it's, it, it's going supersonic, and it can't turn with me. It was the yeah. same way, you know, our, our evasion, our tactics with the MiGs. I had absolutely no fear of like their MiG uh, 15 or 17 mm -hmm. that uh, with my aircraft, I could, I could pull them to a point where their aircraft would come apart. They'd have a choice. Do I want to follow this guy or do I want to break up? Yeah. If you try and follow me, you break up or I, I outturn you. <laughs> That's Never right. Never across any 19s or 21s? No. Nope. Uh, by the time I got over there, they were afraid to get airborne. Right. A friend of mine, actually, he was a friend at the time. I can't call him a friend now because people will throw stones at me. It was Randy Cunningham Oh, uh, called Duke. Yeah, the very famous F-4 pilot. Yeah. He, uh, he got his five MiGs and became, I guess, our only ace, the only Navy ace that I'm aware of. And... Uh, then he became a congressman and let it go to his head, and he started taking bribes and whatever and finally went to jail for eight years, a prison for eight years. Yeah. But uh, he was actually a really good guy. Yeah. It was what, things, what, things happen over time, right? What, but what, by, by all accounts, a hell of a pilot. What, one quick interjection since we were talking about the... Uh, um, he wasn't all that good. All you got to do is talk to his... <laughs> his his Rio, <clears throat> yeah. What one quick interjection since we were talking about the RA five, um, yeah, which is which is uh, which seems like a really odd aircraft because it's so long and uh, it has a it it had a has a very surprising fuselage shape for um, for navy for a navy, navy aircraft and you wonder. You wonder why that is so long and and uh, where that comes from. So it turns out this thing is directly related uh, to the uh, failed uh, F-108 program. Oh, interesting. We, we talked about last week. Yes. So the F-108 was a um, <clears throat> interceptor fighter program that the Air Force ran in the 50s and that the plan and it was the f-108 rapier which was then supposed to be a mac 3.2 3.4 fighter plane and uh, that project went nowhere and got cans um and uh short shortly after the the b-70 got canned those those projects were related but north american was was the was building the uh um the uh, the F-108 and the fuselage structure and the weapon systems of the F-108 are in are in the A-5 Vigilante. All right. So this is well, it's also a North American aircraft. They just repurposed it. Yes. So this is this is effectively <clears throat> these are the remnants of, of the, the F-108 program. And, and, well, I tell and, you, except for that part really, where it couldn't drop bombs, it was great. Yes. <laughs> it was really really fast. You know, mm -hmm. when we would come back from a target, you like to keep the, uh, the people who can't go ashore, uh, who can't get off the boat, who are there for 30 days at a time, uh, something to look at, something to think about. Yeah. So when you got back, you'd call up the air boss and say, hey, you want an air show? If he could and you had any fuel, you'd put on a little show. And the, the Vigi would get down really, really low <laughs> and go really, really fast in, in a big rooster tail. You know, like it looked like it was about 150 feet in the air. And they're supersonic, of course. So they go supersonic and go, come by the ship. And I was climbing in my airplane one time, getting ready for a launch. And you have to climb up a ladder for the A4. And I was at the top of it when this guy in the Vigi went by the, by the boat and broke the sound, and the, the sound barrier hit us. Oh, man. And it knocked me off the ladder, and I hit my plane captain at the bottom of the ladder, 
there and broke his collarbone. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, I tell you know, Captain, before you approve a low flyby like that, tell us about it. You know, yeah, let gonna, us know. Right. Yeah. This was here. I am just climbing in the airplane when boom, that the uh, the thing hit me and off the ladder I went. Wow. But anyway, it's it's really really fast and really really beautiful. It's just it's a, it's the prettiest airplane, and it's got F four engines in it. Right. But if you take the same thrust from an F four, which is like the dirtiest airplane ever, and you put it into the A five, which is one of the sleekest airplanes ever. You can imagine the speed that this thing can develop. Yeah, and I remember a documentary where they said the F four was a demonstration that if you put big enough engines on a brick, it'll fly too. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, if you put, uh, if you look at this airplane, that little window in the back on the upper side, that's where your gib, the 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 guy in the back, <laughs> he's, that's all he's got is looking out out that window two of my students were going a5s and they had moved it from glencoe georgia where they used to be down to key west and uh he went down he wanted to fly the vigilante and i said why and he says because you've got somebody protecting you all the time the shrike guy so right. that's a crazy reason to fly an airplane. But look at the the intake on that thing. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. With, the, oh, with the shock ramp right. on the top. There. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's very much I, like the F-14 uh, intake, right? The, the <clears throat> yes, candid it opening is. with the top ramp. Yep. I have, some, I have some photos myself from my collection. Um, if you want to take a look at them. Um, screen, shall I this? here so joe you stopped sharing there right and yes yes it allowed you to switch okay because i was figuring out if we do this again how do we not get bombed again and and so i think the new configuration is correct when yeah. someone's sharing nobody can hijack it you have to surrender it willingly for somebody else to share yes that is yeah we need to go and fix that that's so the configuration is, i'll use from now on the, yeah because that obviously, and we need to go and figure out how to do, deal with that. Anyways, I have so, already submitted the report, by the way. So where right. is this? Um, this is at the Castle Air Museum in California. And um, they have, that, that museum is absolutely fantastic. And that's at Castle Air Force Base, Air Force Base, um, ex Air Force Base. And that used to be um, a, a a major bomber base, so B-52s, etc. And they have a pretty good museum there now. And uh, they have this fabulous Vigi, as I just learned. Um, and I have a shot that's from the back. So this is one comes off the Ranger. <laughs> the Ranger who keeps running into other boats. <laughs> Uh, shot from the front, and then I have a shot right head on. God, is that sleek? Look at that. Look ah. at that. Yeah. Is that great? Yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. I could have actually gone vigilantes, but I, you know, the mission is not good for me. So yeah. uh, I stuck I with to fly fast, straight, and level over this thing. I mean, yeah. it, looks, it looks fast. It looks it looks fast standing right there, right? Yeah. It's the it's the it is the fastest looking airplane that's probably in that entire collection. Um, yeah, it's it's fast. It, this is this is like this is a, a sports car. Yeah, it's, it's I think they're good for like twelve hundred knots. Uh, easily, yeah, yeah. They're I think I have this here. Is that the right? Yeah, two point Mach two point oh, one. This, this is the German one. Yeah. Mach two point yeah, one was the record. Mach two is the uh, the uh, the data here. But presumably <laughs> at altitude, yeah, flying that fast low is really hard on an airframe. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. 
even you know one of our deliveries is uh you've got to be 500 knots so 550 miles an hour mm -hmm. at 100 feet off the ground that's the delivery parameter for it and mm -hmm. uh and under certain conditions you know certain times of the day that uh that is really really bumpy yeah i bet and especially in tropical environments where the air is rough for the best right time. and most of our uh run-ins at that speed and whatever we're up at fallon in nevada uh where it gets up to 115 120 degrees yeah and you have differences in temperature between the uh the air and the ground which is great for a glider which is what i'm getting into now hmm. uh yeah i'm going to get certified in gliders nice uh, yeah <clears throat> But uh, not so good for uh, flying really, really fast and really, really low that close to the ground yeah. when a little twitch of the wrist can put you into the, into the ground. Yeah. That's like, uh, I, whenever I think about that, I think about uh, Dean Martin's son was flying F-4s, hmm. low level, hmm. and went, went into the ground. And uh, reportedly, Dean never recovered from it. That was his yeah. fair-haired boy. And but uh, it's real, real, real easy. Yeah, very. You hear the blues? Fun. You hear them? No, nope. that's more yeah. than one blue in uh, in formation. Burner oh, flying over the building, flying over your home. No, just taking off. I'm only. Uh, they fly over my house two days a week. Hmm. They uh, they they practice on. Oh boy! Oh, my wife said they're coming back from Washington, where they flew over uh, over Washington and someplace in oh, Virginia. They're, they're doing the tour, the uh, yeah. the <clears throat> tour for the, the healthcare workers thing. Right, exactly. Well, they're ju the, you just heard them. They're coming back right now. Hmm. Yeah, uh, they practice and fly over our house. Uh, mm, I guess it's Tuesday and no Monday and Tuesday or Tuesday and Wednesday every week. Cool. They they go out. And they fly those two days. They fly a complete show. So which airplanes then have they now? take off and go? So so which which airplanes have we? The F eighteen, the Blues. Yeah. No. No. I mean, which oh, airplanes have we, have we we heard you talk about flying? So the A four. Oh. I guess the A4 and that's it. What you're looking at right now is the midway on the day we lost uh, Vietnam for good. Yeah. This was the evacuation of the embassy. And I was the just checking in as the uh, OD, the uh, officer of the deck. I was the assistant officer of the deck. Wow. And I was standing beside Captain Chambers, Larry Chambers. Yeah, there's a, the, oh, this is the guy that landed the bird dog on the midway, Major Gyung, I guess his name was. Anyway, Captain Chambers, this guy's trying to land in a bird dog. And we don't know who these people are. It's just, it's 26 just helicopters. 26 yeah. airplanes uh, helicopters are trying to land at the same time right and none of them have carrier experience we don't know if they're good guys or bad guys captain chambers came back and we had a whole bunch of airplanes uh, helicopters that we had gotten from someplace in vietnam since the the airfield was going to be overrun we salvaged all the new helicopters helicopters these were brand new helicopters wow. and he said push them over the side make room for that bird dog wow i said captain do you really want to do that with all those helicopters to save one bird dog and he got so mad at me uh he said don't ever question one of my decisions again and, uh, 
Well, as it turned out, the people were okay uh, in the bird dog. He landed it because we put on all eight boilers and went to 40 miles an hour on the midway. Wow. 40 wow. miles an hour is fast. Yeah, you could see, see the back of the, of the ship there in that beginning of that shot. Yeah. It just, it's a huge foam in the behind. So they're just, they're pushing that carrier. So you, you threw those, you threw those helicopters off the deck. Yes. Before that guy to be able to fly, to land. Yes, and the this. captain came up and they, they couldn't push them over fast enough. And so he asked for volunteers. So you see people of, you know, yellow shirts, red shirts, no shirts, mm -hmm. all pushing the helicopters over wow. the side. When they tried to push them over, overboard, they got stuck in the, the netting, which surrounds the deck, which is supposed to save people if, you know, they're being blown overboard by whatever. Right. So I mean, he says, did okay. Know, did he know who was on that 01? No. No, there's no way. Oh, okay. Well, let me tell you the rest of it. The, the airplane was making a – that's a, what they call a big mother. Those are yeah. the airplanes that went in to evacuate the uh, the embassy in Saigon. Boy, mm -hmm. they were loaded for bear, too. Unbelievable. There, and so anyway, um, what was I saying? Okay. You're talking about the bird dog. Yes. Oh, yeah, the bird dog. Uh, it flew over the deck, and the guy's hanging out the window – throwing notes out at us. Well, we're in the middle of a launch recovery operation, so we've got 25 knots or better over the deck. So he threw the notes out, and they went over the side. Sure. Well, finally, he makes another pass, and it said, I can the it was a paper plate, and it was stuffed into his holster for his gun. Hmm. And he threw it out of the, uh, the airplane. It landed on the deck, and a Marine grabbed it and ran it up to the captain. And it said I, I th something like, I can land on your, uh, your land. I can land on your landing or something like that. <laughs> and so the captain had all the aircraft push forward on the axial deck. And uh, you'll see that he's landing on the axial. Right, on the, on the straight part, not the, not yeah, the, the yeah. standard part. So, and the captain has said, to, all boilers online, all speed ahead. And so I called to the coxswain, you know, all speed ahead. And here we are still bringing boilers on the line. And you can, you can feel this huge, huge ship accelerating, believe it or not. <laughs> and so we're 40 miles an hour, 40 knots, actually, 44 miles an hour in an aircraft carrier. I had never gone that fast before. And this is a non-nuclear boat. Right. This is a modified access. <clears throat> yeah. And so we've got to get fast enough. So this guy has to add power to catch the ship, essentially. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, these, these pictures of the... The, um, so I'm in Germany, right? And um, so we don't, we don't always, um, as that is with other countries, you don't necessarily always see all the stories in, in all the details. And I have to admit that the story of the carriers in the Vietnam War and then during evacuation is something that I haven't really looked at. But of course, I've seen the pictures of the, the UEs being pushed overboard. Mm -hmm. But I've never made the connection to this to this aircraft uh, landing. Well, that was the reason for it, and uh, it was Captain Chambers, later Admiral Chambers, <clears throat> who made the decision. It was a good thing for them in the airplane that it wasn't Captain Jim Speed running that boat because I would have made another decision. <laughs> I, you know, when you weigh all of those helicopters over the side against a bird dog, and you don't even know who's in it, uh, the choice would be clear. But see, here was the bad thing. The guy is going to land, and the captain said, he is going to land no matter what we do. He's out of fuel. 
Yeah. Uh, for some reason, we had that as a piece of information. I'm not sure why. But uh, he was talking, not with us, but with our Combat Information Center, our CIC. And they're the ones who said, this guy is out of fuel. He's desperate. The captain, who now has more information than I do, right. said he is going to land his airplane, and he's going to land into those F-8s and A-4s. And we're going to have a fire on this aircraft carrier. Yeah. So it was act that was actually the reason I believe that he gave the decision to push her. Uh, it says, "Can you? La I can mm -hmm. land on your runway." Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That was him, Buang. Yeah, Major Buang. Interesting. Well, and that paper plate is in the museum. Wow, and mm -hmm. as and, is the aircraft. As is the aircraft. It's hanging up. Now, after he landed, we took the wing off the airplane, and uh, it went behind the island and sat out there for quite some time. I, I don't know, it, weeks anyway. Wow. Amazing. But, it, uh, well, yeah, CH that was very, very interesting. Uh, that was an interesting day because yeah. he's hella, you know, we're getting calls on the radio will regard uh i'm out of gas i'm going in where are you they're auto rotating where are you uh i'm right near the island I said wait Great. a minute we've got about a thousand islands out there which one are you near <laughs> yeah, so I wonder, I wonder how many folks were lost that day that just oh lots lots it. we evacuated three thousand Wow. More than 3,000. And uh, th there's also a young girl that gets off this helicopter. I don't see her there. She eventually became a graduate of the Naval Academy. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And these CH 53s, uh, even the back then, the night, like the modern ones are enormous, but the original ones were big too. Yeah. They're huge. It's a, it's a bus with rotor on it. And, Dad, how many people were in one of those helicopters? How are they configured in the helicopter? I Okay, when the, uh, when the Hueys landed, <clears throat> uh, we didn't know who was in them. Mm -hmm. And so our Marines were kneeling on the flight deck, all guns aimed at every place, uh, area craft that landed. So if they were bad guys, they opened the door, they were going to be blown away. Right. Not, that okay. never happened, right? It, they were... No, it did not happen. Yeah. I'm but sure one of the helicopters landed, and they pulled... It was all black. And they could, you know, it looked like they were trying to block out the windows so you couldn't see in. And they pulled the, the doors aside, and they told the captain, you know, this, uh, if we're going to have a problem, this is going to be it, because they're blocking our view from the inside. We couldn't see. Well, they pulled the sliding door aside, and a stack of people fell out. Hmm. They, they stacked people on top of each other to get the most people in one of these helicopters, and without the support of a door, they all fell out in a big pile on the floor, wow. on the, uh, the, the flight deck. I don't know why we don't have that girl in the pictures here getting yeah. out of the, uh, the bird dog. But yeah, if you look in the bird dog, there was nothing in there. I don't even know how they talked with anybody because uh, I didn't see a radio. But everything inside was out. Oh, I think they just showed and it. He, one of the plates... <clears throat> One of the messages falling. See, he grabbed it. It right, fell. He grabs it. He dropped it on the deck. Yeah. Well, no, no. I said that. I rem yeah. I was on in the uh, on the bridge when he's throwing these notes out, and when it when the uh, holster landed on the flight deck, the captain came up over the one MC, the big microphone, and yeah. said, "Bring that to the uh, to the bridge immediately." Right. All he knew was it was. A holster from a gun. He didn't even know the uh, the paper plate was in it until they got the holster up to the uh, up to the bridge. 
But I, I wonder if there was someone left behind that was able to radio to to Central Command and say, this guy's on his way. He, he, I don't know. I don't think so, because, it look, you know, they had been living in the field in this airplane. Sure. What What we found with the helicopters was they had taken off, and the pilots had just taken the airplane. They're trying to save their families and extended families. They know that when the North uh, Vietnamese arrive, they're going to kill everybody. Right. And so they go to the field, and all they've got is a bag of rice. And, and so everybody is living on this rice in the field, waiting for some way out. They don't even know what they're going to do until the word is passed one way or the other that Navy ships are off the coast. And that's when they go out looking for us. In most cases, they didn't have radio contact with anybody. Mm -hmm. Right. They're just, uh, they're betting on the come, so to speak. They're going to go out there and see if they can find somebody to save them. Knowing that anytime you ditch alongside a Navy ship, they're required to, to, uh, to save you. As yeah. a matter of fact, there were boats everywhere. And they were pounding the bottom out of the boat, you know, so it would sink. So we would have to pick them up. And then we'd have to launch our boats to go get these people. In some cases, we'd have 100 or more people in a boat made for 20. Crazy. Oh, it was a nutty, nutty day. So where do you put 3,000 or more people on a carrier? The, wow. guy who, the guy that came to my stateroom was the head of Air America for nine years. Oh, my. Ah. <laughs> it's a whole other business. Yeah. yeah that's a whole, I, have a, I read a book about Air America. I have one, I have one here. And that is, that, that is a really crazy <clears throat> stunt. Yeah. They, they were nuts, nutty people. You know, it, it, the whole place was nutty. You know, in one case, I, uh, I bingoed into Da Nang. You can't. You can't land back aboard the carrier if you've got a hung bomb. Right. Because, you know, you just can't do that. So you have to go to Tanang and they ratchet it off, and then you go back to the ship. Well, in this case, it was the last recovery of the day, so, there were, you know, I couldn't go back, so I was spending the night in Tanang. So I went over to the Gunfighter Club, which is, that was the name of it, and I was sitting there having a beer, and this guy came up and he sat next to me and he said, uh, after a while, he said, I can kill you. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, that's a good piece of information that I'll put away and carry with me forever. And he says, no, I can kill you. I may kill you. I said, oh, and the guy it, is getting goofy on me and I said okay I don't believe you can kill me here's what we're going to do we're going to go out the front door of this club you're going to go left I'm going to go right only one of us is going to get all the way around the building the other one will be dead <laughs> how's that he says sounds like a good idea to me so we went to the front door and I got a, a knife from the bartender. Uh, he didn't know what it was for. I just said, give me your strongest knife. And he gave it to me. So I went out the front door. I went right. He went left. I went about 20 feet, and I turned around and went back and went inside the club. <laughs> here I am sitting at the bar having a beer, and this nutcase is out there slowly working his way around the building ready to kill me so he came he came running back into the bar yelling and screaming and it had swinging doors you know the kind that are kind of spring-loaded mm -hmm. and uh, they start about at knee height and go up and all of a sudden those doors went bang wide open one of them fell off the hinges and he came running at me with the knife and there was a F8 driver sitting there, and his name, we called him Windmill. He was very, very tall, lanky, and he, uh, he was sitting there at the bar, and this guy is running towards me with a knife. And 
windmill just took his bottle and fling, flung it at the guy. It hit him between the eyes, and he went down. I mean, you know, like a once in a thousand shot. And the guy <laughs> went down like a sack of potatoes. And meanwhile, the bartender came over, and he said, yeah, that's George. Every time he comes back in, we have a problem with him. That <laughs> This is one of the guys that he's a solo act. They put him out in the jungle alone, and he lives out there for days at a time collecting intelligence. And then, I mean, he's, he's totally alone. He's got to make it on his own in the jungle. Wow surrounded by Vietnamese yeah. and then they bring him back in to Da Nang and turn him loose with real people you know this guy's <laughs> a nutty said why do you do that you must why don't you lock him up until next time it's time to go out then you unlock the cage and anyway that was one of my experiences just saying the place is really really nuts yeah. while while uh while I was jabbering on, we were looking at one of those helicopters that had landed and almost all of them were full of rice hmm. on the floor. The people had been living in the field for, in some cases, weeks. <clears throat> yeah, so they don't have a lot of room. And we had one of the helicopters with about 50 people, 40 something people. I was surprised it could get off the ground. Yeah, no, it's astonishing. Uh, they're also small, right? Like those are not. Oh, no. Oh, uh, what? The people the, or the helicopters? The people. <coughs> that, was, that was the only. Yeah, my, I'm talking so much here. I haven't talked this much in years. Anyway, uh, yeah, lots of little people. And when they pull that door back on that Huey, and a, a stack of people fell out. They were bl wearing black pajamas. Mm. And that's why we couldn't see in. It was the blacked out of, windows were just yeah, right. <laughs> stacked with people I in mean, black clothes. I mean, literally clothes. blacked out. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. I think we're about out of time, friends. This yep, is it. Uh, uh, Jim, thank you so much. The stories are wonderful. Well, I'm. Uh, Sorry, I went on and on. I, no, no, it was exactly no, no, no. everything we hoped for, friend. Yes, well, I hadn't probably. thought about this in 50 years or more, you know. And right. All of a oh, sudden, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And, so know, things start so flashing to mind. So Even, last thing, Dad, what's this? Oh, que sera, sera. Looks like a DC-3. It is. It's an R4D. It's the Navy designator of it. It was my dad's airplane in the Antarctic. It's the first airplane to land at the South Pole. Wow. Oh. Yeah. And your father flew it? He did not. Okay. Not, not on that flight. It was a guy named Gus Shin, who's incidentally a good friend of mine here in Pensacola. Uh, the airplane was being outfitted in Jacksonville for its flight down to the down to the pole <clears throat> and uh, it, that took lots and lots of fuel and whatever so in Jacksonville they put a gas tank inside of the big balloon that held gas and a lot of other changes too like the skis you see on it now and lots of other things the ability to dump fuel very quickly and all of those things Anyway, my dad uh, said, we're being delayed. He was down there to pick his airplane up. He said, we're being delayed, and uh, why don't you come to Jacksonville? So it was summer, summertime, I guess. So uh, my mother grabbed both of our, our, the kids, you know, three of us, and went down to Jacksonville, and we went into a motel uh, right outside Jack's with an above-ground swimming pool. It's all we could afford. And uh, they were outfitting the airplane. And one morning, we were sitting around the pool waiting for my dad to go to work. He was in uniform. And he said, uh, I need to have a name for the airplane. They're going to put it on the plane today. And he said, uh, I think I'm, and my mother, nobody said anything. And 
my mother said, uh, oh, my dad said, I'm going to name it Virginia. And my mother said, absolutely not, <laughs> that a lot of people had been killed in the Antarctic. You know, it's like the ha most hazardous flying in the world. Right. And a lot of them had died. And she said, I, and she didn't expect my dad to come back. She didn't know he was going to go down there until the last minute. Uh, when he got up the guts to tell her I'll be gone for a year. And uh, she said, under no circumstances do I want my name on that airplane when you die down there. <laughs> and, and so I'm sitting there, you know, and, she's, and he said, I need an airplane. Uh, uh, I'm going to name it, God damn it, I'm going to name it Umpty Ump. And he came up with some things you can't put on an airplane. <laughs> unless you give me something and she didn't and then she and my sister who was very small at the time little blonde haired girl dancing around to a song which was the most popular song of the day <laughs> que sera sera what yeah. will be will be that's great yeah and there it is in the museum and there it is and yep. my mo my mother looked at him and she said that's the way i feel what will be will be right and that's what it became hmm. that's a great story great so so thank you very much as said and uh so richard and i are contemplating whether we're going to more going to do more of those and and do that maybe a little bit more give it start giving it a little bit more structure um so it would be fabulous if we could. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna go and and, and make the video uh, right, the recording here, and then uh, we'll put this up on, on on YouTube as we did with the the thing we did last week. Sure. And um, I mean, the stories were absolutely fantastic. Yeah, sure. Um, and then um, maybe uh, you know you could tell tell us a few more. Um, if we're if we're doing if we're doing more of these, we're certainly as I'm, I'm certainly interested in doing so. And maybe maybe some of your friends can too. Uh, I really don't have. I'm in, not in contact with anybody I know that used to fly airplanes. Okay. <clears throat> except for Gus Shen. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. Well, I, yeah, I I was thinking actually when when Joe mentioned this. I was going to go out and ask Gus if uh, he would come, you know, thought it would be interesting for you guys to speak with the guy who made the very first landing at the South Pole ever. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he's in his 90s now. I, I'm not sure. He's about 95 years old. And uh, really, really a nice guy. You know, he and my dad were the best of friends. And... He's 95. My dad died when he was, oh, yeah, there are lots of uh, pictures. Yeah, mm -hmm. just, you know, at the uh, the pole itself, when my dad went in at the pole and the skis all froze to the pole or froze to the ice and how you get out of something like that was kind of interesting. Yeah. And getting one of those engines, we're getting a, an air-cooled radial to start again mm -hmm. under those conditions. No, you don't. You don't shut it down yeah you couldn't turn it off no in fact you know when you start them back at the base they've got all kinds of hot air blowing over the engine yeah, to does. get it started well at the pole the day well, my dad went in after after gus did and it was 107 below zero <laughs> and, yeah it's just and, silly numbers at that point yeah right it, Exactly. So the skis were frozen to the uh, to the to the ice, and so my dad had everybody get out. He said, "Everybody take something to chip with. We're, we're going to chip ice." Everybody got off the airplane, and they're chipping ice off the skis. And my dad goes to a hundred percent, full full power on mm -hmm. the engines, until it finally broke loose. Now he's got a whole crew outside the airplane with screwdrivers in their hand. Right, that need to get back. He's got to get them back on board. So <laughs> you, you can't stop. So what he did was go in circles, and they get one guy on board. You know, and uh, the guy would cut across the, the circle, 
and get in the door and then he right. would help the next person. And that's the way they got everybody <laughs> on board the airplane that's crazy until they could finally take off. And, you know, I've talked to several of the pilots and I, you know, I talk with Gus once a month, we have a meeting of the old Antarctic explorers club. Right. And we have that here in town and Gus is always there. And Gus and I always end up in the corner talking shop. I try and, Put him out. They came to see Gus, not me. So I try and get him out there with his stories and whatever. And we end up in the corner. He, he wants to know about flying at forty thousand feet when he was never that, that high. I, I I told him a story one time about flying uh, uh, something at forty thousand feet. And so he calls me on a phone occasionally. He says, "And there I was at forty thousand feet on my back." Out of airspeed, altitude, and ID is all at the same time. How you doing, Jim? <laughs> yeah. We'll have to uh, we'll have to do that, Dad. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll do right. that. I'm stopping the recording. <laughs>